Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to our service once more this morning on this Trinity Sunday here at Moneyway Non Subscribing Presbyterian Church. You are all most welcome. I hope you have that cup of tea or cup of coffee ready. Please come and join us and let's worship God together. Well, good morning, friends, and uh, welcome each and all to Money Ray Non Subscribing Presbyterian Church for our virtual service this morning for Trinity Sunday. You are all most truly welcome. Our opening sentences are taken from 2 Corinthians and it's chapter 13, verses 11 through to 14 at the end of which we'll hear the customary words which are often uh, offered for a closing blessing and then I'll share a prayer. Words of St Paul where he writes, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to full maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with Christian love. All of God's people here send their greetings. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, we give thanks to God for our verses from Scripture. May God add his blessing to our hearing of his word. Dear friends, let us pray. Almighty God and loving Father, as we come together once more to worship you on this Trinity Sunday, help us also to understand how your fullness is met in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. How you're met also, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. One God met in these profound and distinct ways, with each complementing the other. Help us to remember, Lord, as we heard from our sentences in Scripture, that the Trinity is implied, is pointed to, in your Holy Word, but never defined in a dogmatic or creedal way. Help us instead, we pray, to be content with the wonder of it all and to worship you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who together taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, dear friends, let's now join together to sing our first hymn this morning.
And so friends, I now turn to our children's story this morning. It's just a short story and it's entitled The Moon and the Cherry Blossom. There was once a woman called Rengetsu. She lived far away. She was a Buddhist nun, making a long journey alone and on foot through very dangerous and difficult territory. There were bandits and wild animals to avoid rivers, to cross steep hills, to climb. At the end of the first day, she had walked many miles and was feeling hungry and weary. When she came across a small hamlet at the foot of a mountain, I need to rest, she said to herself, perhaps some kind person will give me some bread and water and let me stay the night in their cottage. She knocked hopefully on the doors, but she was met with indifference or even hostility. We've no room for you, said one man curtly, as he slammed the door in her face. We've barely enough to feed our own family, said another. And how will I know you won't rob me if I let you stay here? asked a woman before she too refused. By now the sun was setting, and so Ringetsu, disappointedly and wearily, trudged up the hillside and made her bed under a cherry tree. She was so tired that she fell asleep immediately, but she woke just before dawn to find that the cherry tree had blossomed during the night and the big golden moon was shining through the branches. It was an incredible sight. So she stood up and faced in the direction of the houses which had refused to give her food and shelter and said, I want to thank you for your kindness. By refusing me lodging, I found myself beneath this beautiful, these beautiful blossoms on the night of the misty moon. I decided to share this children's story this morning because it reminds us that even in adversity that we can find blessings. Rengetsu found her blessings by realising that by being placed outside of the village she could enjoy the beauty of the cherry tree and the beauty of the morning. And even now, in these times of difficulty, we can nevertheless find blessings in our lives. We think of the beautiful weather which we have enjoyed recently, the opportunity to spend time in our gardens, the opportunity to spend more time with those closest to us. So let's just take a, a lesson from that story, that even in adversity, blessings can be found. Even in adversity, we can find moments to treasure. And so, dear friends, I now turn to my Old Testament reading this morning, and it is, uh, as is customary here, one of our lectionary recommended readings for this uh, Trinity Sunday, and it is Psalm 8, Psalm 8, a psalm of uh, David, and on page 417 of the Pew Bibles for those who wish to follow the reading. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them, yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things 
under their authority the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Give thanks to God for our reading from Scripture. May God add his blessing to our hearing of his word. Dear friends, let's now join together to sing our second hymn this morning. taken from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's Matthew 28, verses 16 through to 20. The Great Commission, a passage familiar to us all. But like those words we heard in our opening sentences, it reminds us of the Trinity implied in Scripture. The Great Commission, on page 760 of the Pew Bibles, for those who wish to follow the reading. Then the eleven disciples left the Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all of the nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thanks to God for our reading 
from Scripture may God add his blessing to our hearing of his word. Dear friends, let's now join together to sing our third hymn this morning. more in a time of prayer. We wonder how you have reached down to us through your Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to understand, Lord, that you are no distant God, but one who through the Incarnation became human shared with us our joys, our troubles, our hopes and our fears. Help us to give a full recognition to how you have walked with us, been alongside us through your Son Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet we pray also that we may be kept from arrogance, from human pride, which seeks to constrain, to define this trinity of expression through rigid dogma or man-made creed. Keep us from human arrogance, Lord. Instead, grant us simply that sense of wonder of the one God our Father in heaven met as Father, Son and Holy Spirit and eternal God and loving Father we continue to pray at this time for all of those working in our health services our caring services and we continue to pray that they are kept safe and well. We pray for those they care for. And we ask you, Lord, to grant them health and a good and full recovery. We pray for those once more who have been 
bereaved. We are conscious of the tens of thousands who have lost loved ones throughout the United Kingdom. We ask, loving God, that you look after those who feel their loss at this terrible time, that you offer the assurance of your grace, your love and your peace. All of these prayers we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so, friends, I, I turn now to my address this morning, which I have simply entitled Trinity Sunday. And today is Trinity Sunday. Today we consider both the Trinity as doctrine and as concept. Its central importance to our shared Christian faith. And it is important that we mark this special date in the Christian calendar. Some churches neglect to do so, even those who proclaim an orthodox understanding of our faith. They choose not to preach on the Trinity and simply regard it as an article of faith which must be accepted uncritically. On the other hand, there are non-Trinitarian churches who choose to preach on this state in order to refute the doctrine. There is a logic to their position, but it is, in my view, an equally unhelpful response. The fact remains that for many, indeed most Christians, God is encountered, met as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And as soon as that affirmation is made, as soon as we affirm that God is met in Christ, as soon as we affirm that the Holy Spirit is from God and from Christ, we are all in Trinitarian territory, whether we want to be or not. So what then of the NSPCI? Well, let's be clear about this. The non-subscribing Presbyterian Church of Ireland is not a Unitarian Church. Rather, it is a church which is doctrinally pluralist. That is, that our ministers, elders and members are free to express their faith using Unitarian or Trinitarian or indeed other Christian language. In the past, many of our ministers were explicitly Unitarian. 
That is certainly true, particularly in the 19th century. Then most of our clergy would have affirmed that God is one and that Jesus was or is in some sense subordinate to the Father. But even then, as Reverend Dr. Linda Ballard has explained in her excellent Money Ray Musings, it was freedom of conscience in matters of faith and not Unitarian theology per se, which defined non-subscription. Today, many of our clergy would be more orthodox in their understanding of our Christian faith by my reckoning Many, perhaps most, would be happy to use some form of Trinitarian language. And as with the clergy, so with the laity. Our laity hold diverse views. As my good friend and colleague, the Reverend Ian Gilpin, remarked, if you really want to know where the denomination stands, on the doctrine of the Trinity, or indeed on anything else for that matter, you would have to ask all 4,000 of us. But you know, in truth, I'm not sure that really makes us that different to any other part of the Christian family. Yes, there are doctrinal purists, but most Christians, when confronted with difficult questions, will answer, you know, I'm not sure on that one, or actually on that I take a different view. Could it be that non-subscribers on the question of the doctrine of the Trinity are simply being more honest about their doubts? So what are we to make of the Trinity? Can we divorce the doctrine from the concept? Is it essential for faith today? And if so, what is it precisely that we are affirming? To answer these three questions, we need to briefly consider our two Bible readings. Our first reading was Psalm 8, Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth, your glory is higher than the heavens. You've taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies, all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, you set in place. What are mere mortals, that you should think about them, human beings, that you should care for them? Well, friends, Psalm 8 is glorious. It proclaims the majesty of God, the majesty of God, the Father, creator of all. But, and this is important, this God, our God, is no absent deity. This God, our God, is no divine watchmaker who, having set the universe in motion, simply sits back to allow the whole thing to unfold without making further intervention. No. Christianity, our faith, significantly affirms that this God, our God, cares for us, has intervened in his creation through the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Master, in order to allow us to become truly his sons, his daughters, his children. As the Psalmist David says, you have made them only a little lower than God, crowned them with glory and honour. You have gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks, the herds, the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, everything that swims, the ocean currents, O Lord, our Lord, 
your majestic name fills the earth. Now, dear friends, as we know, and sadly, man turned his back on God. The great sins, human pride, human prejudice, got in the way. Despite the prophets of old who warned the kings of old, this turning away continued and led to the end, of course, to the ancient Jewish kingdoms, until in time the Father then sent his Son. The Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem his lost children, not just the Jews, of course, but all of us too. And so we find, Scripture is clear, in Christ God is met. The incarnation and Jesus Christ is proclaimed as Son of Man and Son of God. Non-subscribers absolutely accept Jesus as God's Son, and we do confess him to be our Lord, our Master and our Saviour, and we accept as well that the Holy Spirit has been sent to transform us. And so we affirm this one God, worshipped as Father, met in his Son and actively transformative by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that leads to a question, does that make us, in any corporate sense, Trinitarians? Well, and here's the key thing, it really does depend on your definitions. Do you mean the doctrine of the Trinity or the concept of the Trinity, for I would draw an important, I believe, critical distinction between the two. The doctrine of the Trinity given to us by the later Church affirms God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and that these three are co-equal and co-eternal. Now, that doctrine is not found in Scripture. That's important. Nor, for that matter, is the word Trinity either. And there is concern among many non-subscribers that the doctrine as stated the doctrine as given risks what is called tritheism. That is, that we end up with the worship of three gods instead of just the one. And yet, and yet we should take care. For my contention is whilst the Trinity is not defined, it is nevertheless and clearly implied. Clearly implied by the words of the grace which we heard from St Paul in the first reading from 2 Corinthians, and clearly implied, no less, from our second reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Let's just remind us ourselves what Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says. Then the eleven disciples left the Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. 
It's an interesting passage. It's an informative passage in the context of any consideration of the word Trinity. Some of them doubted, we read. Well, we still doubt too. We wonder how God saves us through his Son, transforms us by the Holy Spirit. We wonder how that whole wondrous thing works. But be sure of this, our God does do just that. Our God, the one God, is met in these three wondrous ways. As Father, of course, and through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are clearly instructed to baptise in the threefold name in Matthew 28 of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now that is the Trinity that I believe in, the Trinity that we find in Scripture, the one we receive from Scripture, not from the doctrine given to us by the native church. However understandable or well-intentioned that exercise in systematic theology might have been. Jesus did not give us a doctrine, but he did give us an instruction and he left us with a mystery. Well, friends, that is enough for me. That is enough for me. But in the end, on this Trinity Sunday, you too must decide. What's it to be for you? One God? Three gods? Or one God met in three wondrous ways? What's it to be for you? The Trinity as a doctrine or the Trinity as a concept? pointing to our God who is active in his creation with the power of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is it to be for you? Amen. And may God bless you for listening this morning. Dear friends, let's join together now to sing our fourth and final hymn this morning.
and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you and with those whom you love. This day we pray and even we ask for evermore. Amen.